Okay, so we are going to talk about the skunk here. This poem, um, when you read it, or um, I, well, I would encourage you for actually first to read it before you um, go any further. Um, so I'm assuming you've read it. Um, you may have picked up that it seems to be a love poem, which it is. Um, but it's a kind of an odd love poem. I mean, for a start, you'll have realised that he's making a comparison between his wife and a skunk, which is um, unusual to say the least, as a as a choice of um, images, uh, image to describe your wife. Now, um, if you have a quick look at this, this is two quotations from a book by a guy called Neil Corcoran, who wrote about Heaney. And this is what he says about these love poems. He says, the love poems, or as Heaney has called them, the marriage poems, which he, has to, which he was to publish in Fieldwork, which is where this poem is from, that collection, are some of the most outstanding celebrations of auxuri auxuriousness in modern poetry. Interesting word, and I've written a, an, an explanation here. So if you're auxurious, you're a man who dotes or adores his wife. Um, so it says here as an example, your auxurious grandfather, for example, might plan your grandmother's surprise birthday party months in advance. So auxuriousness is this sense of adoring one's wife. And it says here, it goes on to say, Heaney's achievement in these poems is remarkable. He has managed a poetry of ordinary domestic happiness, of the dailiness and continuity of married love, which entirely lacks sentimentality or self-satisfaction. So... They're not poems that are particularly sentimental love poems or um, cliched love poems. In fact, they seem to deliberately um, avoid cliché um, in, in any way that he can. So I suppose this um, comparison of his wife and a skunk, normally an animal sort of reviled and seen as disgusting and smelly, etc., um, he sees something different, he sees the beauty of it, he sees its delicacy and its beauty, and that's what he tries to um, express in the poem. Now, if you remember um, in the poem um, Night Drive, where he describes a drive through France, and he's talking, thinking about his wife and when he's going to see her and all that kind of stuff, he does use this word, ordinariness. Um, a number of times, um, well twice actually, a number of times, he talks about uh, the smells of ordinariness were new on the night drive through France right at the start and at the end then he says that your ordin ordinariness was renewed there. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a, um, a celebration of sort of ordinariness and if you just look at this quotation it's ordinary domestic happiness, the dailiness and continuity of married love. So this isn't the love of teenagers who are, you know, or young people, newlyweds who are um, head over heels in love and, you know, blinded by it. This is a, a sort of a very domestic, everyday love that's grown over years and years and um, a different sort of love from that kind of young love that's often characterised in love poetry. So it's a... Just like the otter, very similar poem, um, does similar things to this, the skunk. So if we begin at the start, you've got the strange, uh, this simile here, which is interesting, but he starts with, Up, black, striped, and damasked, like the chaucible at a funeral mass, the skunk's tail paraded the skunk. Night after night I expected her like a visitor. So, straight away he talks about her, and so by giving, using this pronoun, this personal pronoun, um, he immediately makes the thing feminine, the creature feminine, and straight away then he's beginning that process of sort of making the comparison with his wife. The creature itself, he cleverly... Um, characterizes in its sort of movements and I think he does it by this um, this sort of striking preposition that begins up there's a sense of um, it's a short word and it's 
suggests a kind of alertness and um, it seems alert and it seems alive straight away up black striped you get those three um, monosyllabic um, words um, in, in, a, in a list and they're, they're all rhythmically stressed up black striped straight away and that uh, rhythmical stress gives it a sense of, of being alive and very kind of alert so up black striped and damask, dam damasked like the Chaucer bull at a funeral mass so these words damasked a, a damasked material would be uh, elaborately sort of um, embroidered in something like this picture I've got here um, so it's a sense that um, the creature is has beauty straight away and it sort of f it this suggests a kind of elaborate um, an elaborate sort of finery um, that a creature or that something has been very carefully worked and created in order to create beauty but then we get this simile here of this chaucerable now a chaucerable is a priest's robe um, and there we go there's there's one examples all kinds of different ones and different colors but it's the, he describes a, a, a chaucerable at a funeral mass <coughs> and you can see the when you look at the picture of the skunk here and then you compare it with the chaucerable here you can see there's an immediate, immediate sort of visual impact that he so it's a clever visual image to give give us in our minds how this creature looks because it is strikingly sort of black and has these this v-shaped stripe on it rather like the chaucerable here um and now wh why is he chosen to describe it as, as a funeral mass it's a difficult one to think about i mean i don't think he's trying to suggest anything um to do with death really because that just wouldn't fit with the poem it wouldn't fit with its meaning and its tone but it, um when you put it together with paraded so this w this verb here of per the, the the skunk's tail paraded the skunk and then you think of a funeral mass they both have a sense of something to do with uh, ritual um, a mass is a ritual and a parade also suggests sort of pomp and ceremony Um, there's also other. He goes on to say that night after night, I expected her like a visitor. So that the, the fact that the, as he sat there writing in the evening, he would become to expect this creature to turn up every night and sort of sniff around and parade around with its great sort of elaborate tail. Um, uh, again, a, a, a mass happens regularly so and a parade happens regularly ceremonies happen regularly they have at regular times so that sense of regularity as well um that he becomes to uh, expect it like you do when you go to mass it's every sunday and you expect it and that sort of thing so there's lots of different connotations i think that he's that he's deliberately put in there um and and a mass also because it has this ritual it's a show isn't it it's a, it's a it's the, the priest is dressing up and there's all this finery and pomp and circumstance and it's a show as if somehow and just like a parade is a show as if the skunk is parading herself in a way um and that takes you to some of the the, the end of the poem with this rather striking image of his wife um bending down it says your head down tail up hunt in a bottom drawer for the black plunge line night dress that vaguely comical sense of you know of image of his wife um not particularly flattering in many ways but um um again sort of very ordinary uh, and therefore not overly um sort of sentimental now it may be useful to think about um another poem or a different writer just to get this idea of what i mean by how her 
love poem can be quite ordinary and celebrate the ordinary. Um, if you look at this, this is, as you can see at the bottom, Shakespeare, not um, not Heaney. Um, but it's a very similar sort of poem in its feeling. Um, and it's a very famous sonnet, Sonnet 130, which is a love poem. But again, it, it's, it doesn't feel like a love poem until the end, really. Um, my mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun. Coral is far more red than her lips, uh, than her lips red. If snow be white, why then her breasts are dun. Dun means sort of dull, chewing gum colour. If hairs be wires, black wires grow on her head. I have seen roses damasked, red and white, but no such roses see I in her cheeks. And in some perfumes there is more delight than in the breath that from my mistress reeks. I love to hear her speak, yet well I know that music hath a far more pleasing sound. I grant I never saw a goddess go. My mistress, when she walks, treads on the ground. And yet by heaven I think my love as rare as she, as any she belied with false compare. So you see what Shakespeare's doing here, obviously, isn't he? He's saying, look, you know, she, her eyes aren't like the sun, um, her breasts are not as white as snow, and all these things. Uh, and so he creates this idea of a very ordinary woman who walks on the ground and doesn't, you know, is not a goddess in any way. And, but that celebration of ordinariness is, you know, what he's saying. It doesn't matter who she is. He loves her for who she is. Um, um, and so that's a very similar kind of feeling, I think, to to this poem we're looking at the moment. So um, there we are, a bit that first stanza. So this very sort of. Um, how the creature is described as sort of confident um, it's almost comical as well because it's tail it is an interesting use of grammar here the skunk's tail paraded the skunk so um, the skunk's tail is the subject there isn't it and it seems to be the tail wagging the dog as it were that the tail seems to be in charge because it's so sort of um, uh, dominant and seems to sort of almost move the skunk about so there's there's a mixture of a kind of this language which seems very kind of um, um, elaborate damasked and chaucible quite a kind of elaborate latinate um, lexis but then also uh, a strangely comical um, affectionate look at the creature at the same time and that, I think, tells you something about his relationship or his feelings for his wife. Okay, so we've looked at that. So the next verse, uh, notice he uses here the refrigerator. Now remember, he's he's writing in California, and uh, he's been away on a on a tour in California from his wife for some time, and so he's sort of suggesting the place by the use of refrigerator rather than fridge, as we might say. So, the refrigerator whinnied into silence, my desk light softened beyond the veranda, small oranges loomed in the orange tree, I began to be tense as a voyeur. So some interesting language here, this verb, uh, whinnied, now that's normally, you know, almost always, they're just describing the sound of a horse's, a horse's whinny. Um, makes that sound. Now, if you ever heard a sort of noisy fridge, listen to it, it does have that sort of faltering, whinnying sound, so it's quite just a clever way of describing it. But also a horse's whinny is sort of loud and well, a very sort of shocking sound. So what he's doing is he's suggesting the quiet by using a word here which suggests something very loud, even though it's not very loud, to suggest that he's sitting in absolute silence and it's so quiet that when the refrigerator goes off, because they automatically come on and off, don't they? Then th th he notices it almost as as you would notice the difference between uh, the noise of a horse making that very you know loud whinnying sound and then the silence that followed. So it's the contrast between the noise and the silence that follows which emphasizes the silence. <coughs> 
And then he's sort of creating a kind of romantic atmosphere here. My desk light softened beyond the veranda. And I think what he's doing there, he can see the reflection of a desk, his desk light and it outside, you know, beyond in the window. So it looks like it's sort of outside on the veranda. Um, and then again, this is all about where he is because there's orange trees in California. It's hot, so orange trees and lemon trees grow. It's quite exotic. Small oranges loomed in the orange tree. Um, I began to be as tense as a voyeur. Um, now I think what he's doing here is creating a sort of sense of um, um, drama because we have um, it. The, the, or, the, the oranges that loomed, uh, the oranges, and here we have this strange choice of verb, again, uh, another kind of striking verb, loomed in the orange tree. Um, if something looms, there's, it suggests a, a, a sense of something is about to happen, a kind of a sense of um, o a kind of ominous feeling of something's about to happen. Um, and I began to be tense as a voyeur, so obviously the tension is what he's after here, and the drama of waiting for the creature to appear. Um, a voyeur is, we've seen this word before in poems like um, Strange Fruit, a voyeur is somebody who is like a peeping Tom, <laughs> basically somebody who um, watches things that are sexual, um, but is a watcher rather than a participator in that sexual act, whatever that is. So I suppose somebody who uses f pornography would be a voyeur, somebody who has this kind of prurient interest in um, sexuality, but not actually taking part, watching rather than taking part. Um, so what he's doing there, I think, is he's creating this sort of sense of, of, of or introducing the idea of sexuality um, by using that word, choosing that particular lexis. So there's lots of things you could talk about here in terms of lexical choices to suggest uh, the tension, to suggest the place, to suggest um, how he feels and to suggest him beginning to think about this or what, you know, what am I saying, beginning to create the sense of this poem is, because it's a love poem or a marriage poem, obviously we'll have sexuality as part of it. Something to notice um, is the <coughs> structural points here. And if you look at how this uh, is organized in terms of its structure, um, you'll see that <coughs> in this first sentence, you look at the grammar of this sentence here, you'll see that we, we don't get the main verb until there. So up, black striped and damasked like a Chaucer bull at a funeral mass, the skunk's tail paraded the skunk. So we start with a subordinate clause before the main clause here. Now why does he delay this main verb? Why does he delay the <coughs> the main clause? I think he wants to give that sense of movement so that when you start with a subordinate clause it pushes the pace of the sentence because you're waiting in anticipation for the main verb to come. Um, if you imagine reversing it, so you'd start with the skunk's tail paraded the skunk up black striped and danced like a chorus with feudal mass, it doesn't quite move the pace of the sentence on quite as much. So that's one way in which he moves the pace along because he wants to create this sense of its liveliness and its on its um its vibrancy so that's why he wants it to be sort of quick and pacey also you'll see that the zonjolment there chaucerable at a funeral as the skunk's tail paraded the skunk and there and we have this uh, caesura here so he's deliberately um, sort of messing with the meter, with the rhythms, in order to um, keep the pace moving, so you have more enjambment here. <coughs> um, and again, the same thing, it starts, it, it, we don't get the main verb until here in this sentence. So the main clause is comes second in both sentences, and enjambment also 
gives a sense or, or creates this sort of pace as it carries on. Um, um, now, when you get to here, however, he then goes sort of back in time as if he's waiting for the creature to arrive and he wants to create this tension. So, but look then what he does. Now we have no enjambment because we have end stopped lines all the way through. Now, if you remember, an end stopped line in poetry means that the whole meaning of the line is contained and finishes at the end. Now, now these also have full stops at the end, so that adds to that sense of of, of things being completed at the end of the sentence. So it doesn't run on to the next sentence. So there is a real sense in which the pace is slowed right down. The refrigerator whinnied into silence. Full stop. My desk like softened beyond the front. And again, you have a, a different um, grammar as well. So if you look at the grammar compared with the first verse, we have subject, verb, subject, verb, subject, verb, subject, verb. So w he's no longer delaying the main clause. They, they are just four main clauses. There's no subordinate clauses. And so we have four simple sentences. And that four simple sentences with end stopped lines, which really slows it all down. Because what he's trying to create is obviously the silence is important. So this is why he slowed it down, because that will create silence as you read it. There's no hurry. Uh, he wants to create drama and he wants to create tension and so he slows everything down, simplifies everything, it makes these end stop lines to suggest him just waiting in the silence with not even the sound of the refrigerator and he's tense and so he wants that sense of, of space within the poem at this point. And so that's a quite a good structural point you could use if you were talking about the effects that the writer creates in creating the tension at this point in the poem. So stanzas three and four are all about how much he's missing his wife and it's also about the sense of place and how he conflates this the, the sense of place with how much he misses his wife if you see what I mean. Um, he starts with after 11 years I was composing the love letters again so the idea being here that we get the sense of him sort of revisiting or rediscovering something, rediscovering his love for his wife and I think the next the, the, this stanza the next one seems to suggest that being in this place, in this rather beautiful place, kind of um, re-energizes him and re-energizes re him as a poet and frees up his imagination. So there's a kind of a rediscovery um, both of his love for his wife but also for poetry and being a poet and this kind of thing. Now he does talk um, you know, interviews I've seen with him about this time between 1970 and well, 1971 where he was touring or lecturing at the University of California um, uh, how it sort of revitalized him as a writer so there we get that that sort of revitalization of his love um, I was composing love this again broaching the word wife so to broach a subject is often described as so when you're trying to broach a difficult subject or something like that you're trying to say something that's awkward now um, so this the choice of this verb here suggests that he just saying the word wife, thinking about the word wife again, is almost kind of foreign or alien to him, and that he's come to rediscover this idea. And that's why he's got these inverted commas here. The inverted commas suggest almost as if he's trying it out. Um, he's, he's sort of saying how it feels in his mouth, kind of thing, that word which he uh, hadn't really thought through recently, you know, about her and about his relationship with her. And I think, you know, I seem to remember when I was first married, the idea of, you know, some introducing some, you know, introducing my partner as my wife. So well, this is my wife and it seemed, seemed odd somehow. It seemed an odd thing for me to say. It seemed awkward and I didn't feel sort of grown up enough to say it. But um, obviously now it's second nature to me after many, many years. But And I think there's this, the same idea that that newness of that word seems to have come back to him after 11 years as he 
because of the the, the, the separation from her. And he then uses this the, to, to reinforce this. This simile here, I mean, he describes it's, it's taking using this word again is like taking out a sort of an old bottle of wine, a stored cask, a suggesting like a a stored bottle of wine, um, which would be, as you know, wine. Good wine is supposed to get better and improve with age. So there's um, the idea that perhaps their relationship has pr improved with age, she has improved with age, the idea of wife and having a wife has improved as the relationship has, has um, grown over the years. And also uh, this comes back to the idea of tasting the word, to the idea of tasting the wine. And it's quite a sensual image uh, which is backed up by the sensual images here of later on in the poem in the next stanza about uh, smell and taste and all that sort of thing. And then he actually uses the sounds of the word, so it is as if its slender vowel had mutated into the night, earth and air. Its slender vowel is the slender vowel of wife. Slender is obviously a sort of a, a reference to his wife's shape, so it's kind of a complementary um, um, description of her, which you might suggest, it, you might um, expect in a love poem. Um, um, but it's it, but it, you, he, I hope you can see by him r referencing the vowel in the word and putting it in inverted commas, the idea of him saying the word I think is important and then tasting it almost like a glass of wine. And um, and he and smelling it or tasting it in the earth and the air that it seems to be all around him. Um, it's a difficult blindness, as if its slender vowel had mutated into the night, earth, and air. And obviously, the, the start of the next stanza is of California. Um, he seems to be associating this place with this rediscovery that somehow the the place itself, the earth, the air, has has brought this rediscovery of love and of poetry back to him. Um, and then so if you look at the next one that carries on, you know, of California, so that's the enjambment there is deliberately foregrounded um, this, this place because this is the important thing that he's talking about. Then we get lots of phonology in this one here, and the phonological, phonological effects here, so you get the beautiful useless tang of eucalyptus spelt your absence, so you can hear the sibilance in all these sounds here. Um, to suggest the beauty, uh, the quiet, the silence, the peace that he feels. Um, you get the assonance and um, consonance in eucalyptus, useless, you can hear those sounds there, so you get assonance and consonance. So the repetition of vowel sounds, also the repetition of consonant sounds. Um, and you hear it here, T there, and T there, and T there. And the, the tang of eucalyptus spelt your absence. Um, beautiful tang, eucalyptus. There's lots of consonants and assonants all the way through here. To, and the idea is to create euphony. So if you remember, a euphonous sound is sounds that are pleasant and a cacophonous sounds are sounds that are unpleasant so he's de de definitely creating a euphony here um, and then again he almost inverts these two words the aftermath of a mouthful of wine so aftermath mouth so you got math and mouth um, aftermath of a mouth there's a definite euphonous feeling here of lots of things seeming to be connected as if the there's a connection between all these words here so it gives us a kind of a unity to this stanza as if all the sounds and all the, t the, the smells and the tastes are all mixed up together with his memory of his wife um, and he comes back to this idea of tasting it like this glass of wine that we had this stored cask in the last stanza uh, of wine was like inhaling your cold pillow so that the smell and taste which is all about wine tasting, isn't it? Both those things. Um, he it's, it makes it a very sensual, almost sexual uh, image there. 
and also but also the idea of he's missing her because it's a cold pillow so she's not there so her absence by the fact that the, the pillow's not warmed by her is um is important but also the last thing to notice is that he does say all amongst all this beauty so he's surrounded by the beauty of the place and the smells and the, the wine california is famous for its wine and the the lovely air and the scent of the eucalyptus trees. These eucalyptus trees have this very strong scent or perfume. And again, it's all very sort of um, reminiscent of him thinking of her smell. And, you know, he says inhaling you and her, you know, a taste of a kiss perhaps in wine. Um, <coughs> But he also says that it's useless. All this stuff is useless, and so there's a sense in which the although it's very, um, it reminds him of her and it makes him think of her and makes him think, it's almost too painful because all these things are not her. So they're they're not not no not her. So they're no use to him. Almost I mean, they're useless, um, despite being very beautiful. Um, and just as he begins to think these things, you get to the next stanza. Um, where we have and there she was so and this is back to the skunk and the, the intent and the glamorous so this is very much you know um, uh, in reference now to a woman uh, rather than an animal isn't it intent and glamorous ordinary mysterious skunk mythologized demythologized snuffing the boards five feet beyond me so uh, it, uh, the 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 idea that the con the way that it starts with the conjunction um it suggests that it it almost he was waiting wasn't he before in stanza two when you get this tension and then but and there she was suddenly the conjunction suggests that it it just happened that suddenly the, the after all that tension of waiting the creature just sort of pops up from nowhere and um glamorous obviously suggests again sort of uh, complimentary about his wife and this comes back to the idea of this thing parading he says it paraded didn't he um, whoops I'm trying to spell that right paraded uh, earlier on in stanza 2 and there's almost like it's putting on a show it's, there's all this glamour um, and the chaucible and all this kind of Im the idea of it's being damasked damasked is very beautiful but at the same time, it's the, you get these these oxymorons here. Ordinary, mysterious. And an oxymoron there is suggesting that I think his wife, like the skunk, comes back every night. It's, he says that he's expecting it every night. It's a very ordinary creature, you know, in one sense, and 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 that's why it's a strange uh, comparison because a skunk is not normally seen as glamorous. It's seen as the opposite, but. To him, um, the ordinariness of it is is just as important as its mystery. That the, 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 it's both at the same time, and again, mythologized, demythologized. So the skunk has this sort of mythology of its, you know, hideous smell that you can never get off your clothes and all this kind of thing. But to him, it's almost very ordinary. It's become ordinary as it comes back to him, and and every night and its ordinariness has made him feel that he likes it that it's, it's comical in some ways but also glamorous in some ways and perhaps again that's something about his relationship with his wife that they enjoy each other in a a way that's not a, a kind of cliche in a cliched romantic way but they can laugh at each other there's a kind of humor between them in their very ordinary lives and there's a very ordinary word, snuffing the boards five feet beyond me. It makes it seem very kind of um, like a, a very ordinary, very un, you know, not not a myth mythological creature in any way. Um, just very very ordinary, going about its business, but in a way that he finds charming. Um, and then moving on to the next one, uh, we get. It, came, it all came back to me last night, stirred by the sootfall of your things at bedtime, your head down, tail up, hunt, tail up, hunt, in a bottom drawer for the black plunge line, that plunge line nightdress. Um, so I think this, you know, he sort of goes forward in time to 
when he'd returned to his life and it all came back to me all this memory of California came back to me and of the skunk um, and, um, and you know his encounter with the skunk and how he felt at the time it came back to me last night and so as he's waiting for her to get into bed um, it was stirred by says the soot fall of your things at bedtime it's a clever um, neology I think um, he's made that word up I think the idea of I think is uh, um, something you won't probably know about but um, if you have a chimney and you're cleaning it um, a chimney sweep then what happens is the, the, the soot will often just fall in a big big um, lump all together but it it makes a kind of very soft sound as it hits the hits the bottom of the fireplace um, obviously then so the soot is associated with the, the color black um, which is all in these two images here that he uses um, um, but also the idea of uh, as she drops her clothes that similar sound as the kind of flump as they hit the ground or hit the carpet in that soft fall of the clothes as they uh, as they fall to, to the ground um, and then this again I said before this sort of comical images of your head down tail up hunt in a bottom drawer for the black plunge line nightdress and again like the chaucerable image before we get this as you can see the kind of visual similarities between the two of the black um, nightdress there which is um, I suppose isn't it the kind of the sexual sexually alluring thing and it's it's there's a sexual image there as well which is what he's you know that his love is n not just um, you know a, a kind of <coughs> affection but also sexual at the same time but it, it's, a, it's clearly not a particularly um, <laughs> glamorous or um, flattering image here um, your head down tail up in the bottom drawer but it's kind of it's it's ordinariness is really the important thing but at the same time it's a sexual image um, we're not putting too fine a point on it so he 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 sees he, I, what I suppose what he's getting at is here that he she is although a wife of many years and very ordinary and that's what he likes about her and almost vaguely comical at the same time he still finds that sexy he still finds that a kind of um, a stirring image um, as it says here a stirring image an image that sort of gets him going <laughs>